My name is Gerhard Hendricks. I'm here in London at the annual ESC meeting and it's my privilege to welcome Professor John Cam from London. John, the uh, burden of atrial fibrillation still is very, very present. What, is, what are the recent developments if we look to the field of atrial fibrillation over Europe right now? Well, just a few years ago, I think that most people thought of atrial fibrillation as a highly symptomatic disease, palpitations, tiredness, chest pain, breathlessness. And when we thought of it like that, the calculation was that atrial fibrillation was present in about 0.5% of the population. But then we realized not all atrial fibrillation is very symptomatic. In fact, quite a lot has very subtle symptoms. So you have to start to look for atrial fibrillation in a very, very systematic way in order to find out how much atrial fibrillation is really there in the community. And the surprise is that it's much nearer to about 2% of the population. So if you take, for example, the United Kingdom, we have about 60 million population. That means there's about 1,200,000 patients with atrial fibrillation. And about a third to a half of that is completely asymptomatic. And we discover it because physicians are now feeling the pulse, detecting irregularities of the rhythm. And in other, on other occasions, people are doing electrocardiograms and finding atrial fibrillation where they never expected to find it. What are the key risks for patients that have detected atrial fibrillation? And what are the, the key things to do once it has been detected? Well, we're concerned about atrial fibrillation because, of course, it's not an entirely benign disease. When it occurs in young people, it's symptomatic and it's probably quite benign in the majority of cases. When we have made the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation and it has been diagnosed on the, the ECG, the key decision on treatment strategies, rate control versus rhythm control, has been taken. What is your advice to approach that decision? Well, I think that uh, symptoms are very important, for example, and often a patient has a reasonably controlled rate, or if not, he may have had the rate controlled already by the administration, for example, of beta blockers, and yet the patient is still symptomatic. And I think if symptoms persist, despite adequate rate control, then that's a clear indication to try and provide uh, relief of the atrial fibrillation, in other words, to adopt a rhythm control strategy, in which case you may well make the patient asymptomatic. When it comes to rhythm control uh, treatment for the patient, there are two key options in these days. One is enterythmic drug treatment and the other option is interventional treatment by, by catheter ablation. What are the key points in the decision-making process to go either way? But I think that most physicians would first choose an antiarrhythmic drug. And we have a choice of antiarrhythmic drugs, some of which are very easy to administer, and others of which you've got to be very careful with. But for example, we have agents like beta blockers, which are strictly speaking not specific antiarrhythmic agents, but they're easy to administer, and in a certain proportion of patients, that would be sufficient to revert the patient to sinus rhythm and to maintain sinus rhythm. If we have to move to specific antiarrhythmic agents, then we have to decide what the level of underlying cardiovascular disease is. If there's no significant underlying cardiovascular disease, we can use antiarrhythmic agents like class 1C antiarrhythmic drugs, flecainide or propafenone, or we could try sotalol, although I'm not a particular fan of sotalol. And the other antiarrhythmic agents we have are also class 3 drugs such as dronedarone and amiodarone. I think in most cases a class 1C drug is tried first and failing that often physicians will revert to amiodarone. And if there's underlying cardiovascular disease, amiodarone is often the first chosen drug. So antiarrhythmic drugs first, but often the antiarrhythmic drug doesn't work sufficiently well and the patient remains symptomatic. Under those circumstances, you would think about using an intervention such as catheter ablation. We have learned that quite nicely a couple of years ago, 
when uh, the results of the initial uh, outcome data of the Mantra Path trial uh, have been presented, I think, at ESC two or even three years ago, showing that both treatment strategies as first-line treatment, enterythmic drug treatment and catheter ablation are effective in uh, uh, maintaining sinus rhythm in, in uh, these patients and that there is a profit from catheter ablation and from enterythmic drug treatment as well. A little bit to me promoting the idea of trying drugs first because it's, it's the easy approach. Now, we uh, will see here in London the five-year follow-up data of the patients that have been included years back in the Mantra Path trial, assessing the outcome of catheter ablation versus enterythmic drug as first-line treatment. And we will see uh, a superiority of catheter ablation as compared to enterythmic drug treatment uh, after five years. What do you think could be the implication of uh, these long-term outcome data from Mantrapath? Well, clearly the more successful the technique and the better the discrimination in the success of the technique of catheter ablation compared with antiarrhythmic drugs, the more physicians will lean towards using catheter ablation. But often is there's still a very good reason to try an antiarrhythmic drug approach before moving to a catheter ablation approach because, of course, there are some potential hazards in the intervention. Perhaps not very great and particularly not in very skillful hands, but if it becomes a very widespread option of moving immediately to ablation, there is likely to be a large cadre of physicians who are not particularly skillful in the technique unless the whole process is developed relatively slowly and systematically so that we could take on board a much larger load for catheter ablation. So we have learned uh, during the discussion how important it is to detect atrial fibrillation and thereby making risks for the patient obvious and treatable. We have learned that it is very, very uh, necessary to take the risks serious and to take the right and appropriate actions when it comes to the decision whether rhythm or rate control is the preferred strategy for the individual patient, symptoms seem to play a key role. When rhythm control is necessary, try antirhythmic drugs as first line. You don't do wrong going that way. If it fails or is not effective, go with catheter ablation. John, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you very much, Gerd.